everybody, I'm Chad Ecker. That's not Eric Martins. You are watching the Fantasy Golf Pod. Follow us on Twitter at Fantasy Golf Pod. Today, Wednesday, April 1st, everyone around the world is quarantined, doing virtual happy hours. That's what I'm doing. I've decided to do virtual interviews with some of the industry's insiders, people in the business, people have seen things with the wisdom. Today, I got somebody from the state of 10,000 lakes is Zachary Turcott for the Fantasy Golf Insiders. He's here. Cheers to you. Thanks, brother. I appreciate it. I got a furious beer. I got a Vikings hat. I got a wild shirt. I got a mug with the state of Minnesota. We're rocking it out, dude. This is a Let's represent. Good stuff, man. Good, glad to be here. It gives me something to do tonight instead of just counting the hours. <laughs> Exactly. Where are you at the moment? We are both in Minnesota, but where are you? I'm in Bloomington. You're out in uh, Upper I'm Northern over the area? Roseville area, kind of just kind of the northeast side of the Twin Cities. So the, uh, the 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 older money part of town, I guess. So. And you're you're half of the duo of the Fantasy Golf Insiders. Yeah. You are Zach. There is Jeff Bergerson. Where is Jeff? Is he in Minnesota as well? He's like your neighbor too, right? Somewhere underground, yeah. He's uh, he's in the middle of tax season, so he's he's irate. I get one, one or two really angry t- uh, text messages every day based on what's <laughs> going on with all the tax changes and things. I mean, he's normally pretty irate by the end of February, beginning of March, when he still can't quite see the light at the end of the tunnel. But now he's particularly pissy now that the tax date's been moved back, and he's getting a thousand phone calls every day from folks. So I just check. I give him like a health and welfare check about once a day. <laughs> Uh, just to make sure that he's still with us, um, but yeah, for for now he's he's doing that. We've known each other since we were we were kids, uh, four or five years old, going back to preschool days. We've been best friends, and so uh, it was just natural for us years back when he came up with the idea in uh, in 2014. And we sat down, and he got enough alcohol in me to uh, to get me to take this thing on with him, and uh, and so ever since then, since November of 2014. We've been, so you're like the first person to do it then, basically. Uh, you know, <clears throat> I'd have to say I'd have to say Pat Mayo was probably the the uh, the original guy who was who was doing it, and he'd do like a little five five to ten minute um, sketch on his own where he'd talk about each tournament, what was going on. It was much briefer than anything that he does now in terms of getting real in depth. But yeah, he was really the only name. Uh, I think I think him and uh, I think Notorious was probably writing about it at that point but there was nothing real big in terms of like content or production so within like six weeks of having the idea in 2014 we were up and running by the beginning of january for the uh for the sony was the first tournament that we covered in 2015 uh we headed off down to they have a big uh a a group it used to be called the fantasy sports trade association or whatever it was and so we just after starting we zipped down there um just we're hoping that our site would stay live while we were there so we could show everybody within the industry. It was pretty cool. I mean, we got to meet all the people that, you know, we'd read and seen you know, Matthew Barry, all the guys from ESPN. It was a little bit smaller uh, in those days, but we got to, you know, meet and talk with guys like Pat and to connect with everybody around the industry. <clears throat> That's kind of what gave us a start when we got going and we we're able to link okay. up with Pat and started doing his show quite a bit that year. And from there it, it kind of gradually blossomed and and now the whole industry has just exploded. Where did you get the confidence to start this business and to just go for it? And and when the, it was an unknown, is this your background or did you want to be a fantasy golf guy? Like what, why do you do this? So so we have a little little invader here coming to the room. I'll be back in a minute, buddy. Oh, we have invaders all the time. I'm sure you know. Well, uh, so, so I've so got anyway, a toddler. Eric's got yeah. a toddler. You've he got comes, children. He was, he was, he just about came in running around shirtless. So I just <laughs> hope he comes back. He's still got pants on. So that's the goal. Um, but no, I mean, all my confidence came from, came from Jeff. Cause he, uh, I mean, we, we've been playing fantasy football since age, it was around age 11 uh, in sixth grade. He came into class one day and he said, Hey, I've heard of this thing called fantasy football that I think we should try out. And so we played the heads up, head to head every week throughout the season. We did our own touchdown only kind of league. And we've been playing, you know, ever since uh, with family and friends that we've, that we've known forever. Um, but then he got into the whole fantasy golf craze on DraftKings. He, and he jumped in sometime around 2012, 2013. And I get these texts from him on Sundays like, hey, I just won 
three grand or five grand on some on a fantasy golf tournament and I'm, and I just thought well, what the hell is this how is how is fantasy golf even a thing I mean I could I could I could name you know the top players in the world or the guys you see on Sundays but I didn't have any real extra insight into the golf world than than anybody else that was out there so after a while of seeing him win again and again and kind of develop his own tools I just said you got to cut me in on this like let me know what's going on here teach me the game this was at probably the beginning of 2014 you know who are you picking how are you making your choices and so he kind of shared with me his tools and his process and his background and so we kind of went with that all summer and I started to play bigger and bigger um, and then yeah he went on vacation at some time in the fall and came back and he had a whole notebook full of ideas and uh, we sat down and he said you know everything you don't know I can I can help you along with if you've got any any kind of questions or things he's like you already you already have a great background in sports and fantasy and you're a good writer he said the, the rest of it will, will will come as we're as we're working on it together and Cool. If he's got an idea, usually that's good enough for me. If I see him flying over the cliff, I'm usually not too far behind. So that's how we got here, I guess. Now, who's the military guy? Are you both military guys? I was a military guy. I was in the Air Force. Nice. Um, Thank you. My background here, I, I, yeah, I went. I was a, a pilot. Was kind of my first career. So I went to school at the academy in Colorado Springs, and then flew um, flew tanker aircraft. Did, did the air to air refueling. Um, those types of missions for about a decade or so, and then got out and went back to business school and then got into financial planning. And for Jeff, he went to St. Thomas. Uh, he's been in tax, he's been doing taxes since he was at St. Thomas and he just took it and built it up into a business. And then he got into financial planning as well. So a uh, couple different things that we do. It's, it's a lot of fun right now in that uh, <laughs> both the market crashes and golf all goes away at once. So it's, you know, kind of a- So kind cheers, of a what are you drinking now. tonight? I don't even have anything right now. I was just, I'm just happy that the video feed is, is still working since we tried it the other night. It was a complete disaster on, on my end. So I'm no, just we have tech issues together. every week. Um, yeah. We are talking to people about their journeys into DFS. You kind of explained that. And then when they have become DFS players, have they had a hashtag mega profit? Have they scored bigly and had a story from it? What's your proudest moment? Do you have one? Well, we've had a couple that worked out pretty well for us. Um, we, back when DraftKings first started with golf and got real big in 2015 and they had the millionaire makers and things, they actually had a live final, which I know that they had finally planned on doing again this year. And it's now obviously wiped out again. So it's, I guess we're just cursed in that regard. But we did get two qualifying tickets for the first live final, which took place in, in Boston uh, back in the fall of 2015. Um, out of TPC Boston, you know, so it was a, a FedEx Cup tournament event, um, and it was uh, it was actually one of the more heartbreaking moments of our fantasy sports lives. In that we had there were only 25 people who qualified. There were only 25 entries total okay. in playing for this prize, and you know, the first prize was 200,000, which obviously would have been great. But we were really there to try to raise our profile on mm -hmm. uh, the fantasy industry, and so we got out there. You know, we brought our two other folks along with us that we could take as guests um, you know strategizing putting our heads together building our teams you know we finally get out there it's a bloodbath immediately for the, the first couple days I mean every team is just struggling to get a full roster through nobody gets six of six out of the 25 entries oh, no. we had one good five of six team five of six team that was left and we were right in like second or third place at the time so we're getting pretty pumped. We're like, we have a shot at this thing. If the team just holds together for us here, there's a very decent chance that you know we can overtake the teams in front of us and, and take this thing down. So we get out to the course. It's Saturday morning. We're following Rory McIlroy. We're quietly rooting against him because we don't have him rostered. And there's one other Oh, guy you're who's... out on the course with it too. Yeah, yeah. Everybody is. Everybody who's in that's the thing. Crazy. That's what makes the live final so great for golf. Oh, that's amazing. You okay, okay. There, I get it. Like watching your guys. You can trail whoever you want. Try to bring your black cloud over whoever you're cheering. So you're against. not yelling in Rory's backswing, but you're not not no, yelling. No, not yet. Yeah, <clears throat> and so and I mean by this point we've already had a couple catastrophes along the way. I mean it, it's actually kind of funny. On Friday we're walking along with Brooks Kepka, and this is in his rookie season before things have really taken off. But he'd been really hot at the end of the year. Everybody was rostering him on their teams, and we were he, he was going through kind of a blow up 
moment and looking very unlikely to make the cut. And he had a very unfortunate uh, double bogey near the in the back nine that was just kind of crushing to to one of our one of the teams that we had in play. And and the reaction among the four of us, I mean, we didn't scream outright, but Jeff actually fell down to the ground. <laughs> he was struck by lightning. I walked away. A couple other guys that were, were with us were hanging their heads and uh, turned so out. The gallery's he, like, why do you even care about this guy? Well, it just turned out his, his mom was right there walking along next to us. <laughs> so it was kind of a disaster. But anyways, so the next day, Saturday, we get there. We're excited. We're in the mix. We're in the hunt and we're walking along. And Jeff just looks at me and he just kind of grabs my arm. He goes, we're dead. I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. What, are you, what, are you, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? He said, Paul Casey just withdrew before the third round. We're done. Oh, and no. So you got bit by a withdraw in the, in the final, mid, in the live a final? mid-round withdraw. Yeah. But so like Saturday? Made, so he played yeah, two so, rounds? So he made the cut. He was in like 25th place going to the weekend. And he withdrew after the second round, which crippled our team. I uh, think I remember up, him doing this like, at the time, but I don't know. We finished know. like sixth place overall, like a good effort out of him. We would have been in, like just a decent effort. We would have been second and went a hundred grand, uh, a pretty, a good effort. We would have, we would have taken it down and won the 200 grand, but instead, you know, we'll never know. So that was, that was crushing. That was on the downside, I guess, upside. Um, you know, Jeff qualified for the live football final as well. A couple years ago, it was exciting um because you guys have football on your site you're not just exclusively golf right yeah we kicked off we have we started off a football website like we had content on the golf website and we realized just we wanted to brand it more so we started up football insider edge last fall and kind of branched out and anybody who had certain tiered level of subscription packages for our current golf site would get kind of grandfathered in and get free content on the football side as well so we just we wanted to try to reach a broader audience so we did we did put that out, but yeah, Jeff, he's qualified for the live final out there. Um, his biggest hit, like he had, uh, he does a lot more GPPs than I do. So I think it was like opening day of 2017 or so. He won like uh, $130,000 uh, on opening, opening Sunday and was, was like a, a stolen touchdown there. The Cardinals are at the one yard line, David Johnson, first and goal at the one yard line. He's got David Johnson. If he scores, he wins like another 250,000. Instead they throw the fade to Larry Fitzgerald. So he uh, he didn't quite get the big prize for that, but that was that was still fun. That was that was exciting. Well, so um, are you guys kind of higher stakes players? Because I played for like five bucks or whatever this year, or three dollars yeah. a lineup, and uh, Zach Ertz took like fifty dollars from me catching a touchdown yeah. on Monday night at the last second. It was like the worst. It could have gone to anyone else, and I wouldn't have lost anyone. And I like, took fifty away, and fifty is decent amount of entries for me so i mean obviously a hundred thousand dollars is that a huge hit against your bankroll well, that was yeah that was <clears throat> that was the that was uh no i mean we're not we're not we're not up in the stratosphere with some of the other bigger names for me you're not an empire maker or, uh no yeah like right I'm, i mean I'm, i i have no problem playing against those guys I, I see them in all the cash games every week like so for so for golf the, the majority of my funds go towards cash games um, the 50 50s Jeff is primarily on the GPP side and that's sort of how we, we write our columns in, in terms of our areas of, of expertise where we okay, perfect this is great ball. because guess what I've been talking to GPP players basically that's all I've had on here that's yeah. all we are I am at least right, so right. what's the cash strategy now is there a cash strategy or are you thinking it's like you just play the right plays you play the good plays there's really enough to it well no, there's you can definitely make mistakes in, in cash games I mean you see guys you see guys get too fancy I mean for a long time there were guys who there were guys who would make the argument that there's no difference between a cash game lineup and a GPP lineup and I always have just said for golf that's that's fundamentally wrong um, you know football you can get away with that a lot of the time just because of the fact that there's no cut like if your guys don't perform well in the first half you don't lose half your team or a couple players on your team whereas in golf if you get if you get wild if you get crazy with with a certain play it can end your whole line it can end your whole week all at once and, and I think the big way of looking at it is that you know you're not I'm not as worried about uh about chalk plays in, in okay. golf right so if my whole lineup if my lowest own golf my my, my lowest own golfer is is like a 30 percent golfer going in that's a that's a win for me I'm already feeling good about my team it's it's those people who isolate themselves on an island and go for that one percent owned player where they're the only person owning them overall. 
Just think of it this way. If that player, if that player hits and you end up with like a first place lineup that week, you don't want any more than the guy who finished right in the middle. If that 1% guy misses the cut though, you're, you're almost dead at that point, unless it was, unless it was really just a, a complete chalk smash that week where nobody's, nobody's chalk players made the cut. So, you know, you can end up with that 1% guy uh, missing the cut and it doesn't hurt any of the other teams that are out there. So, I mean, so that's your, a, your focus is I'm taking good plays regardless of chalk and you're, are you starting yeah. the week looking at the names that are going to make the cut? Is that the most important factor yeah, to you? I'm, I'm, looking, I'm looking for value. Yeah. That's, that's really what I'm, I'm looking for is, is, is value. So you see, and it's, it, it's different and it changes. I mean, if it's a no cut event, obviously the strategy has to adjust, you know, at that point, you're going to open up what you want to own and you'll probably own a lot more of the guys that are having the potential to win the tournament. You know, you might own the Justin Thomas or the, or the Rory McIlroy just because you're not getting punished as much. If you take that $6,700 player and he doesn't, he doesn't do quite so. I mean, maybe he's like 45th place or something, but it doesn't cost you nearly as much as if he is, if you were to miss the cut. So um, so yeah, from, from that regard, yeah, I think you definitely have to think of it differently. Cause I, I look at, I look at the lineups for players every week and I still feel like people aren't really fully em- embracing the concept. You'll still see a lot of people paying up, uh, big in, in weeks where there's not that deep of a player pool overall so that they're really just kind of guessing on their bottom three or four players and hoping for the best. And that's going to work some of the time. But even, even in like a great season, right? Say it's a season where like last year, McElroy is the player of the year. He won three times, right? So, I mean, there's, there's probably four or five times where if you have him on your team and you missed badly with one or two guys at the bottom, it, it still worked out. It still paid off. But there's still plenty of times when he finishes ninth or 12th or, you know, 25th. And there's even going to be a couple of times a year where he, where, he, where he misses the cut. So I've just never really seen a lot of extra value in, in full cut events in paying up to go after those guys. So typically my cutoff point in cash games is going to be somewhere in the mid to high nine thousands range overall. And then I'll just kind of play it from there, depending on how much depth there is available within the field, what kind of values are available. Okay. Do you have the same process each week? What's your process? Like you have the show on Monday. I mean, you write an articles Tuesday, they get published. You're making lineups Wednesday. Is that typical? Yeah, that's kind of how it works. I mean, yeah, I, I try to start a little bit ahead of time. So, mm-hmm. you know, the, the, the guys actually have to, they, all they have to do is by Friday sort of declare that they're in the tournament. So usually late Friday afternoon, you'll see the next week's field. And I'll start to kind of look over that field, who's going to be there. I try to figure out how weak or strong that field is going to be ahead of time, because that, that's going to kind of shape my, my strategy or my approach uh, overall. I'll look back over at, at previous tournament histories, I'll start to kind of build my own Excel file to just look at history and form. So hopefully by Saturday and Sunday, I've, I've, I've had a little bit of a look before all the numbers come out on Monday. So then Monday, I'll, I'll start putting all that stuff out. I'll start publishing some of the tools online. We always have to wait a little while for the odds to come out and then the prices to come out. We've got our developer who kind of builds and puts everything together for us. That usually comes out right around like six, seven o'clock at night or so. He's got everything up and loaded by then I've already done a decent amount of research but by that point I'll start to kind of look over the the texture of the field I'll I'll try to see you know is this is it going to be a week where there's a lot of value plays or where there's a lot of guys in the middle range or is it so bereft of talent that I'm really going to be stacking on the top end and then just taking a lot of flyers uh, below that so I try to already have the research picture at least somewhat ready to go before we jump in do the podcast, and then I start to put everything else together. So yeah, Monday is all tools that we put up online, doing all the prep work, doing the show, and then I try to I try to build my player pool um, on that Monday night so that by Tuesday, once I finally stop procrastinating <laughs> and sit down in front of my computer, I can just write straight through and uh, and not have to stop too much to go back on anything. On a full field event, 150-ish players, how many are in your player pool? Are you cutting it in half? Do you play 150 lineups? Or are you one of those people? I Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll generally focus most of my attention on the cash games. So, I mean, generally... So then you really only need a one team, really, right? Yeah, I'm usually a one lineup guy in cash games. Um, so I'll play anywhere usually between $1,000 to $2,000 of, of, of cash games every week. And that's kind of the majority of my play. And then 
I'll typically build 100 to 150 lineups in whatever small ball offering DraftKings has. So if they have like the $5 drive the green where they've got 100,000 up top, then I'll build I'll build 150 lineups uh, for that. Are you using a separate player pool entirely then for that? Well, I've only got one cash lamp, so that's only six guys. Oh, okay, so, so then you don't care. Yeah, okay. So I'm, so then I'll, I'll typically build a player pool. I, I would think my average player pool comes in around 35 players or so okay. if I'm building that many lamps, 35 to 40. And even there, I'll try to work with our subscribers because they always want that perfect number. But there's <laughs> not, you know, there's there really isn't like a, there really isn't like a perfect number to, to go with. I always try to explain it. My, my philosophy is I am looking to be – I'm looking to be like a like a sniper, right? I mean, if you're if you're firing a gun at a target, you know, you're trying to hit you're trying to hit a bullseye, right? I want to be like a I want to be like a sniper, like I'm I'm trying to hit one small spot in the bullseye. Okay. In terms okay, of my target, okay. so that so in that regard, I'm trying to limit my player pool down so that when I hit, I'm very heavily concentrated with a lot of different bullets up at the top, as opposed to you know if I've got 75 play right. If I'm just spraying it with a shotgun kind of approach. I mean, so I've always tried to tell people it, I think it's kind of a mistake just to play guys, you know, if you're building 150 lamps to have a guy in there, you know, some $60, $600 player in there one time. I mean, even if that guy, if that guy happens to win the tournament, you still have to hope that he made it through on a, on a six of six team where six of six might've only been, you know, a 5% hit overall for the week. So I try to give myself extra bullets of, you know, if I'm going to play a guy, I want to have enough conviction to at least play him on, three, four, five teams overall. So that, you know, if you do have that week where that off the wall kind of player wins, you've got a few chances there to get him through um, on, on a completed lineup. So for, you know, for me, I say a little smaller player pool, but then you're going to expect a little more volatility, right? You're going to have, you're going to have bigger weeks when you hit, but you're going to have bigger losses when, when you whiff. Whereas if you're spread out a little more and you own, uh, you know, a set percentage of each of the guys, that are up at the top and in the middle and you don't really take any big fades any anywhere, then yeah, you're not going to lose as much, but it's going to be tougher for you to hit the big prize, which you need to do if you're going to be successful in GPPs. On FGI, you have a lot of stats you can play with. Do you have a go-to stat? What's your favorite stat? My favorite, I mean, I, I don't know that there's, <clears throat> I don't know that there's any individual one, right? Cause if a, a stat in and of itself, I mean, if you're looking at like strokes gain, T to green, right? I mean, that's that's probably going to be your best stat that you're going to want to look at all the time. But at the same time, if you're looking at that number over, you know, a five-year period or a two-year period or even a one-year period, it can mean a lot of different things. You know, so if you're looking at it, like if you're looking at a guy's stats right now from 2019, that might be a decent representation of, of where that player is at. But Maybe it's maybe somebody's taken a big step forward in their game, or maybe they've fallen off. You know, so you have to you have to have some context behind those. So I mean, all the all the strokes gain stats I think are fantastic, but you also have to kind of understand where the player is at within a given period of time to make it kind of relevant to your process. For sure. So, when do you think the PGA will come back? Do you think we're gonna get it? in july like i do oh, or not man i don't know it's it's really tough to say um just among the major sports leagues i think everybody's kind of watching everybody else at this point just because mm -hmm. it the dominoes went so fast like when as soon as rudy gobert tested positive it was people just couldn't cancel quick enough mm -hmm. uh, or shut everything down quick enough and so i think a lot of it's going to be the same way in, in starting back up everybody is making sure that they don't make the big pr mistake of getting out first and then having anything at all happen with uh, with their players so right. that they would have to shut back down again so i think it's likely that these guys are going to err on the side of caution right now golf has uh been canceled essentially all the way through may so um I just saw that. I, I think and like the, china tried to do basketball again and then they've stopped that so that's kind of like the litmus test yeah. is to see what they're going to try to do even though I don't really trust them necessarily. And I think golf, golf naturally would be the first one you could bring back. Yeah, exactly. I think so too. And that even when they shut down, it was like, yeah, I mean, if there's any, if there is any game that promotes social distancing, it is golf. I mean, having, yeah. having 300 guys spread out over a 10 hour period, over hundreds of acres, like the golf, golf would probably be 
the safest one once they're ready to come back. But I, I really think, I think they could be- test everybody too. Like let's get everybody to test before they go out on the course. Like there don't want fans out there. We don't yeah. It's, 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 it's a challenge. I think it's all, it's all going to be kind of for, for PR. We'll have to see the, the numbers and things start coming down. And well, what about us, dude? Are we going to be able to golf? Do you golf? You golf, right? I mean, not right now. Like it's been, I don't golf as much anymore with, with my regular business and with the golf side, uh, maybe, maybe once or twice a year. So it's, it's, okay. it's pretty, it's pretty rare. Jeff tries to get out outside of tax season. He gets out on the weekends and, and plays a little bit, but it's a, uh, it's much more of a challenge now with the two businesses and then with the, with the kids uh, running around, it's, it's just not near what it used to be. So, well, yeah. that, you know, it is what it is. What's new with the fantasy golf inside? Like you just said, you have a fantasy football website that hopefully by September you can get into and you can pay for and you can right. get a, access to. What else is going on over there? Anything new? Uh, yeah, I mean, we're still developing a lot of different tools. And I talked to the developer the other day, I told him, I was like, just let's hope and let's hope that golf does make it back. Um, we've added a lot of great stuff. We've been having really good success. You know, we added a, we added a, like a, a weekly betting picks um column that we'd been doing really well on we'd hit like four weeks in a row coming into um the players championship so so that was pretty exciting we just added a, a slack chat at the beginning of the season so uh we've got a really awesome community of of, of, of folks that that are in there and even now we'll still kind of ch- check in just to see how everybody's doing and you know yeah see how that's going so we so we've got the slack check going we're actually building right now i think our developers putting together um like a course comparison tool that you'll be able to use where you'll be able to select several different courses um in in terms of a comp course for the given given course for a coming week and it'll kind of pull out all of the statistics based on the composite of those specific courses just kind of show you uh which players look to be most favorable based on the court the courses you're cool. selecting there so that's a lot of different things that are are still in the mix. A lot of things that we want to keep uh, we want to keep adding to the website. So um, yeah, hopefully we'll get some golf back here soon. Yeah, and it, hey, if they play the 3M Open, we're gonna be there. You'll we'll meet up with you guys. So DM us, let us know if that ends up happening at the end of July. Is it? End it's, of, yeah, end of July, I think. Yeah, which, for yeah. now. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully, keep <laughs> keeping our fingers crossed. I mean, I've heard weird things like they. I mean, they, there's a chance they could completely redo the entire yeah, schedule exactly. when they do start back up. Because I've been hearing talk of like the Masters maybe being in like October. Mm-hmm. It mm-hmm. wouldn't shock me if they if they shifted like the PGA Championship to, to sometime in August. I mean, we could just see July, August, September, October house each of the four majors. Oh, I'll be so um, good. You know, so I, I mean. It, it, it could be, I, I think they'll be scrambling to see when they come back, but when they do, I think they'll, I think there's a good chance that they'll get a little bit creative yeah. uh, with the schedule just to make sure that we get the best possible events. Um, and also to, to make sure that they get enough events in place so that you know, if they do have the FedEx cup playoffs, it gives everybody a fair enough chance to kind of get qualified. Right. Cause there's so much that's up in the air with status and points and all of those types of right. things. So looking forward to seeing what they come up with. So when they're back in action, download Fantasy Golf Insiders Podcast on all the podcast platforms. Sign up for their website. Follow them on Twitter at Fantasy Golfers. Thanks for joining me, Zach. Appreciate you, dude. Thanks, Chad.